Hello and welcome to Student Hub Live with me, Rob Moore, coming you, to you from my study shack in rural Leicestershire. Uh, lovely day out there today. Uh, I've got the doors open, so we might get to hear some birds and some squirrels if we're lucky. Um, so really good to have you all with us today. And we've been joined by some of my colleagues from Wells. So that's the Faculty of Wellbeing, Education and Language Studies. And we've got a really interesting program today, and we're going to be talking about research and scholarship, uh, something that's one of those topics that uh, we think of as being remote to us when we're students, but actually it's something students can get really involved with. Uh, we really want you to be involved with us and get involved with the chat throughout the day. And we've got some experts on the hot desk today. We've got Jackie Musgrave and Jill Clifton, and they're going to be answering any specific questions that you've got in the chat. Uh, you'll know their answers are there because they've got SHL next to their names in their responses. And of course, we've got the wonderful HJ, who's going to be coming in and is going to be telling us about your comments and your thoughts. So let's start with you, HJ. Who have we got and where are they joining us from? Well, we've got lots of people joining us in the chat and I'm really pleased to hear that they're enjoying the sun as well. It's not just us in South Wales. So Paula says it's very sunny here in Newcastle. Uh, Gil is in the Cotswolds, but uh, may have some storms forecast. So this good weather never lasts long here, does it? Um, Sasha says uh, it's very cloudy here, but uh, yesterday was gorgeous. Uh, Sarah's reminding us in this hot weather we must hydrate, but unfortunately chocolate doesn't help with that, which is news to me because I that was my fix for today. <laughs> and Caroline's made uh, a great uh, opportunity with the weather. Caroline visited uh, New Covent Garden Market at Nine Elms yesterday and Nine Elms we planted, which sounds like a great opportunity and she said it was fantastic with the weather and uh, Toran gives us all an A up as well <laughs> so we're all coming into the chat do let us know where you're from how you're feeling and what you're studying as well we'd love to hear or you could just sit back and enjoy but our guests love to hear your fantastic thoughts comments and questions and uh, if you want to talk about chocolate like me and Alexander by all means do so as well everything goes in the chat <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, for the scientists out there, if you can come up with some rehydrating chocolate, I think you're on for a winner. Uh, so today I've got four guests with me in the studio and I'm going to introduce them quickly. We've got Alison Fox. Now, Alison's a triathlete and her personal research has been about early career teachers and their development. Uh, we've got Steph Dola. And Steph is a staff tutor who tutors on E117 and E314. And Steph's research focuses on the sociology of sport. Uh, we're really pleased to today to have a student with us. We love to have students joining us on Student Hub Live. And Kitty's joined us. Um, Kitty's a BA Honours student studying early childhood. And she's got a real interest in the development of children um, through psychological context. And we found out she's just published her first book. It's a book of poetry called Wild Violet and is a tribute to her mum. And I know that HJ's done a wonderful job. And if you're interested, he's put the link to the book in the chat box. And then we've got Kate Breeze with us. So Kate's the Associate Head of uh, the School of Education, Childhood, Youth and Sport. That's a mouthful. ECYS. <laughs> And uh, she has the oversight of the student experience and she's a staff tutor on EK313. So lovely to have such expertise with us today. And uh, we're going to have a really interesting discussion about scholarship and research. Now, you'll see a widget on the screen at the moment. So the widget, these are our little uh, interactive activities you can take part in. And this one is a Wordle and it creates a word cloud. And what we want you to do is think of three words that come to mind when you think of the word research. And then you can add those three words to the word cloud, and then we're gonna have a look at that in a little while. And as always, keep contributing to the chat, keep asking questions. Those of you who are familiar with Student Hub Live knows there's a bit of a competition. Can you put me off and make me laugh during the session? 
as definite uh, bonus points if you can. But we don't want you to put any personal information into the chat. Remember, it's a public forum, so just be careful what personal information you do share. So that's all that started. Let's get into the conversation. We're going to start with Kate. Now, Kate, scholarship and re um, research, what are they? Because I'm not absolutely sure what the difference is between them. So can, can you tell us the difference between scholarship and research? Well, I'm going to have a try, Rob, but they do sit very closely together. And, and it's one of those things that I'm often thinking, what is the difference between scholarship and research? Um, I think one thing that helps me distinguish between the two is thinking about scholarship as being about our practice. And so for me and, and for colleagues here and indeed for our students, scholarship is about the practice of teaching and learning. And scholarship helps us to ask questions about the way we learn and how we learn and how we work with our students, how we teach our students and how we build um, on our students' experience and their successes. Whereas I think about research as being more about um, generating the knowledge and um, the knowledge of our specific academic subjects that we then build into our curriculum and that um, the knowledge that students then learn about as they study our modules. So knowledge, practice, that's kind of how I tend to distinguish between the two. But research, but scholarship is indeed a branch of research. Okay. Excellent. Uh, so that, that's a little clearer and I know Alison you're responsible for research and development uh, in the school. Um, what do you think about research and, and what is involved in your job? How do you support people to do that? Well, yeah, as Kate says, um, Kate and I both sit on the on the senior management team and um, along with Jackie Musgrave, who we've got on the hot desk today, and we've all share um, responsibilities for making sure there are connections between um, the scholarship that's being carried out, that's carried out about our, our programmes, for our programmes, but also um, the research that might also be called scholarship. We have um, a wonderful professional doctorate programme where all of the, the those, those researchers are studying their own practice. So as Kate says, they are engaged in practice-focused research, which could be another way of thinking about scholarship. Um, and so we, we want to make sure that um, all of that can be drawn on to inform whichever practice it's it's studying. So you, we sometimes call it pedagogic research because it's research about pedagogy, about the the the, the way that um, curriculum is is not delivered but um, shared with um, with learners. Um, we we don't like to deliver curriculum um, here, but that's that's what it's all about. It's about exploring, as as Kate says, perhaps the content that comes in from. Um, evidence-based um, research projects that we need to then talk about and share in our in our uh, modules um, and when well with one another. So you might have heard about practice-focused research, practice-based research, uh, pedagogic research, um, and that's where the overlaps between um, scholarship and research lie. But we work very closely together to make sure that anything that's relevant to the curriculum, the pedagogy, the assessment, also about the assessment practices can be fed into um, and to what students experience here. Excellent. And actually, we can have a quick look at the Wordle, at the word cloud, to see what students are thinking about in terms of research. So if we pop that up on the screen, let's see the types of things that you're saying. So research, academic journal, interesting, the future, fun. Excellent. We like to see fun in research. New information. Um, the rabbit hole. Oh, we, we, we talk a lot about going down the rabbit hole and going off at a tangent, definitely. Uh, <laughs> literature review, uh, study and investigation. So some really interesting points that um, are, are coming up there. I just had a comment there from Angela. Libraries are heaven. So absolutely. <laughs> we all love a good library. Uh, so, Alison, were those the types of words you were expecting to see pop up? Uh, is that what you think of when you think of research? Absolutely. I mean, 
um, research is really about continuation of sort of that natural curiosity that we all have um, as we come to um, open university students are always curious about learning um, and about the the next module I, I was just thinking about going to graduation recently uh, where somebody was awarded um, an undergraduate um, two undergraduates and a postgraduate um, qualification all at the same time. Um, and so research is a part of those um, modules and those qualifications that people are studying. Um, but as I, I'm not surprised to see questions, um, comments like demanding in there as well. Um, yeah. So, and the rabbit holes, that sort of being <laughs> the feeling of potentially being overwhelmed by how much there is to learn. Um, and that's where we need one another. We need the scaffolding. Um, that's where we have a curriculum to scaffold that, um, that, that knowledge, but also within research projects. Um, however um, deep you dive into research, you'd think a doctoral program was you know, probably the highest sort of, um, the, the largest project you could take on. It's actually the starting point. Um, and again, people are on those programs really thinking about how can I focus and narrow down this research so as not to become overwhelmed. Kate, I think. And yeah. You might want to add I, I, something. Oh, yeah. Kate, is there anything you want to add to that? Were, were those the words you expected to see? Yeah, yeah, they were. And I like that mixture of words between thinking about the elements of research, so like literature reviews and going to the library or electronic journals and finding out what's already there. And then those qualities about excitement and curiosity, because they're so important that they underpin our kind of research practice. But I think the, the other thing for me, Rob, is that um, research and scholarship is really exciting because it makes a difference. We do it for a reason. There's a purpose behind it. Yeah. And that purpose might be um, trying to improve our practice, develop our practice, make things better for our students or for the children and young people that we work with, for instance. It might actually be shared with policymakers and have a, a wider impact in actually changing quite you know structural things for children and young people the way we educate children and young people for instance um, and it also has a, an impact on the way we think so as researchers we're always learning and the way we think about our subject is always being challenged and the way we think will always be changing and equally we share our ideas with other people to develop their thinking and their ideas as well absolutely but, uh, and sorry to <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, the other point I just wanted to make was that, as, as Alison said, research isn't an end in itself either. You don't kind of do a research project and there's a full stop at the end of it. Quite often, research just leads to another question. You, in, in exploring one question, you find 10 more. And that's what, for me, is really exciting about research as well, that it's about generating new ideas, new, new questions, and new ways of collaborating with other people to ask those questions. And for me, one of the exciting things is working with students to ask questions. Absolutely. And uh, just back to Alison for a second, because Alison, I think you've got a video you'd like to introduce very briefly because we're getting towards the end of the session. Sure. Um, yes. Well, I was going to say that um, we, we've all been talking about the fact that you, you need to um, base basically decisions, as Kate's been talking about, on evidence. So we asked one of our um, students, um, an alumni of our master's in education programme, what evidence meant to her and what engaging in research through her master's qualification had meant to her, both in her practice and as a researcher. And, and she created this video for us. My name is Anne. I'm a primary school educator and I'm thinking about research and its benefits um, in my context. What counts as evidence in my context depends on um, leadership or practitioner. For leadership, it would very much be the Education Endowment Fund, um, data from summative assessments, as well as um, book scrutinies. For myself as a practitioner, much more formative um, research um, data from what I'm seeing and doing within the classroom with the children and self-selected research from Open University, where I've completed my master level course, or Times Educational Supplement and also Union Materials.
My views on evidence gathering have changed hugely through the master level study with the Open University. So where before, um, it, I was very much reliant on media and management um, research that was presented to me. Um, now I much more um, think about how the evidence has been gathered and um, what tools were used for that gathering of um, the evidence that's supporting that piece of research. Um, and I give myself much more permission to examine and question and decide whether or not I agree or whether it, it fits the context with which I'm working. It's definitely saved time when I'm trying to make sense of a problem. Um, understand my professional behaviours, having been doing the job for many, many years. I feel much more connected and supported to a group of educators and other researchers, both novice and expert. Um, think much more strategically about the end goal and how research can help me to achieve that. And finally, um, strengthen my sense of agency and voice and identity. I really uh, imagine it as that form of an adventure. Um, using the, the process of research as a way to guide myself through um, unknown territory and um, trying to identify what will be the right tools to take on that journey. And there are so many tools to choose from in research. Um, also, another really important idea is holding on to that of, of treading lightly, of using the ethics and thinking very much about the impact of the research and why I'm choosing what I'm doing and asking the question that I am in order to tread lightly as I try and find the answers or better understand my situation. Well, it has always been impacting my practice. I just wasn't aware and the master level course and the dissertation helped me to understand much better the impact it does have and what impact I allow it to have. So um, thank you for bringing the video Alison, that was excellent. I think we're going to jump straight over to HJ now to see what comments we're getting from the students. So HJ, what are students saying about scholarship and research and what sort of questions have they got at the moment? So we've uh, got a lot of people interested in doing research themselves, which is fantastic. So Paula's uh, interested in researching economics and gaining broader insight to the subject. Deborah's studying for the new art history and vid uh, visual cultures degree. And Deborah says, I'd like to do some volunteer research for my uh, local museum and art gallery at their collection, which sounds fantastic. Uh, Anna's just about to start the MSc uh, psychology conversion and is looking to go into research afterwards. And uh, Alexander says, I work with a protest demonstration group. For, so for the last 10 years, I spent my time researching unavoidable deaths in the care system. Um, and Deborah has a, a question as well, which would be really interesting to know from our guests. So Deborah's uh, just starting out and wants to know, any recommendations for a beginner's book on the research progress or uh, process or generally where would you start if you're looking to research something and haven't had experience before? Okay, ec excellent question and I think our topic three is the perfect place to come back to that one so remind me of that question when we come back to topic three because I think that was the, the right place to answer it. Uh, our second topic we're going to be looking at um, student well-being and mental health. So you've got a new ticker tape question. So there's a question going across the bottom of the screen. And we want you to share with us any hints or tips that you might have to help you maintain a, your positive mental health. So if you can pop those into the chat box and what we'll look at then is we'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll come back and see what suggestions you've got. Now, I'm, this, uh, this topic, we're gonna to be talking with Steph and Kitty. And we're gonna start off with Steph and um, Steph, uh, I believe that you've been working on the Student Wellbeing and Mental Health Handbook. So do you want to introduce that to us and tell us a little about the handbook? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think to begin with, it's probably worth giving just a little bit of 
brief background here. Um, so a couple of years ago, the school of ECIS, which, as you said earlier, Rob, is quite a mouthful, um, Education, Childhood, Youth and Sport, uh, created the ECIS Student Voice and Wellbeing Group. And within that, we've got representation from both staff within the school and also student ambassadors. Um, and it was our ambassadors who, at the beginning of this academic year that we're just finishing up with, suggested that we work on the development of a wellbeing handbook to, to really support students through their studies. There's a lot and you know, a wealth of information out there on, on student well-being and, and the OU has a lot of supporting tools but actually sometimes pulling some of that together to, to kind of create one resource uh, felt like it would be really beneficial for students. So over the last six months uh, a project team of four of our student ambassadors, two members of staff within the um, student voice and well-being group, myself included, and a couple of associate lecturers have created this handbook and it's based on the five ways of well-being um, so if I can remember them off the top of my head, uh, connect, give, take notice, keep learning and be active. And within the handbook itself, each way of well-being is introduced. It's supported with a range of activities that students can undertake to, to help develop that area. But most importantly, it offers a kind of holistic approach to supporting a student's positive well-being. Um, the handbook also includes several pieces of artwork and poetry by our students to kind of really bring the student aspect and, and their involvement of it to life. And the key to the handbook is that it's a resource that's de been developed by students for students. Um, and students who decide to have a look at it can complete it or work through it at their own pace. It can be picked up at different points of the year whenever a student sees fit. It doesn't have to be completed in a kind of linear fashion, sort of one page after the other. So literally, if someone can have a look at it, do a few activities and then come back to it at a later point, whether that's you know days later, weeks later, maybe even months later. And it's been created as an online PDF document with kind of the overarching aim of increasing visibility and increasing the profile of good mental health and well-being at what is really kind of a, a key and an early stage in the student study transitions. Excellent. I, I think we're going to pop over to Kitty now, one of the students who was involved in developing this. And um, Kitty, what I'd like to know is how did you get involved? What part you played? But before all that, tell us about your poetry book. Tell us how that came about and how you came to publish it. Oh, thank you very much, Rob. That's mm -hmm. a great question. So <laughs> I've been writing poetry on and off since I was 15. And during the lockdown, I came back to poetry. It's always been a love of mine. And I just decided to sit down and write one day. So I started writing and compiling all my poetry. And I found a lot of what I had written had been about my mum. And recently, on the day that I published the book, it was the anniversary of her 15th death. So I mm -hmm. thought it was a good way to honour her memory. So that's how Wild Violet came about. And it's been selling quite well. Excellent. And uh, of course, the links are there in the chat box. So hopefully it'll sell even better after today. Uh, so did you find that that experience helped you with, um, with taking part in this project? It did indeed. Um, I've been a student voice and wellbeing ambassador for just over two years now. And in my role, I felt like it was really important to engage with the students from my perspective, as well as working with the teams that work with the students. And a lot of the questions that I was getting through from students was about well-being, study anxiety, um, maintaining mental health and imposter syndrome. And I thought, well, I'll take this information because it's a good starting point. So I took it to a team's meeting one day and that's how the birth of our well-being handbook came about because a lot of the resources that I found were proven to be a little bit outdated and I thought it didn't really reflect the whole student experience as I saw it. So we took that information and we decided to collaborate with students on artwork, poetry, um, just gathering their voices and seeing what mattered to them and what was the most important things they wanted to say and how we could best support them during their study journey. 
Oh, that sounds fantastic. And um, if students engage with uh, with the handbook, what are the types of things you hope they're going to get out of it? So when you started this project, what was the uh, the end goal? What do you want students to, to benefit from most? Well, the first thing that would be most important to me as a student myself is that it brings greater awareness of student mental health and well-being to not just the students, but to the university as well. So we can take a more proactive approach on supporting students through their study journey. And I also want students to feel that like they're not overwhelmed, that they're not alone. There is support out there for them should they need to contact it. Absolutely. It sounds absolutely fantastic. Um, Steph, I'm wondering if you could give us a bit more information on when we're going to find out a bit more about the handbook, when we'll be able to uh, perhaps see it or hear about it. Absolutely. So we're at a really exciting point in the development of the handbook at the moment because the content's been written. Um, and as I speak, it's currently under design. So soon the project team are going to be seeing the resource kind of really brought to life with, with not just the content, but the design that sits alongside it. Um, the wider ECIS Student Voice and Wellbeing Group is going to be working on a dissemination strategy over the summer so that we can establish how, how this resource can reach as many students as possible across the university. So our initial aim is that it's going to sit, the handbook will sit on qualification induction sites as well as general program sites. And we also have a hope that tutors are going to advertise it to their students so that students know exactly where to find it in the new academic year. So I guess for now, it's a little bit of a kind of a watch this space um, because it's going to be launched in line with the new academic year. So you, students are likely to hear a lot more about it at kind of end of September, start of October in line with the new presentations. Brilliant. And I know that the team on the hot desk have been putting some links into some of our current materials. So if you want to uh, start immediately looking at some of the mental health and well-being materials, there, there's some things there to get you started while we're waiting for this to be published. Uh, I'm going to jump to HJ now. So HJ, what are we hearing from the chat box? And uh, also, we haven't really asked where our furthest flung student is yet. Where are people joining us from? <laughs> no, we haven't quite got there yet. But if everyone wants to let us know, you'll see a widget to the left of the screen where you can put a little dot on the map or tell us where you're hailing from. We'd love to know and try and see if you're the furthest student out there. That'd be really interesting to see. So, um, before we start on uh, our question, I know uh, myself included, we think it's such an amazing achievement that one of our fellow students has published a poetry book. Uh, Deborah says many congratulations and Jackie who's helping in the chat agrees it's a fantastic achievement and thank you so much for sharing your story and your poetry with us as well. So we asked uh, um, the question, do you have any hints and tips or things that work for you to maintain positive uh, mental health and well-being throughout your studies and we've got some great ideas and responses so uh, Seisha says uh, engage with nature every day I always take time out to walk my study buddies which is fantastic we all love our study buddies so uh, we love the study time. buddies <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to take a break and have a little cuddle with your study buddy or some time out isn't it that's what we like <laughs> Um, Paula says, I found that keeping in contact with my tutor and my student colleagues really helpful and making use of the OU network. I know myself, sometimes when you're stuck in a bit of a rut, it can be hard to remember, can't it, Rob, that there's so much support definitely. around you. Yeah. And um, yeah, definitely just keeping in mind that it's there um, can be helpful. Joanne says, rest and replenish your mind is also important following intense study periods. Um, and Paula says, don't be too hard on yourself. We're always our own biggest critics. I think that's something to remember. We set such high standards for ourselves, and sometimes just the fact that we've completed something, passed something, read a page, read a chapter, that's an achievement in itself and we should recognise that. So lots of great hints and tips. So do let us know your hints and tips as well. We'd love to hear them in the chat. And I'm sure Rob would love to hear as well. Who's our fear the student out there? Fill in the map to your left and let us know. Absolutely. Shall we have a quick look at the map and see where we're distributed? 
Um, I'm dead easy. I'm right in the middle. That's where I sit. Um, can't see if there's anybody off the map. So we're all, all of a, a, is everybody joining us today from uh, within the UK? Well, we've got four people in Europe, haven't we? And uh, it, it's nice to see there's some fellow Welsh students with us as well. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> we always got a good showing, a good Welsh contingent, don't we? <laughs> excellent, excellent. And I quite like the comment from Helen here. She says it's uh, scary to take out time out of your study because of the deadlines. And um, it, it sometimes focusing on your own mental health can seem like it's counterproductive but if you're refreshed if you come back feeling ready to work you'll speed up and hopefully the swimming in treacle feeling will go away uh, so uh, so thank you uh, steph and kitty for taking us through the the handbook we'll be coming back to you again in a couple of moments um, we're going to move on to the third topic now and kate's going to talk to us about some project awards so the ek313 we love our ac acronyms at the <laughs> ou yeah. ek313 issues in research with children and young people so kate um could you tell us about the um the awards that you're involved with and how they were set up yeah yeah and yes it's a mouthful isn't it again <laughs> and we're actually going back to this topic of research rob because um as as you said this module that i tutor on um is all about carrying out research with children and young people and it's the final module that students studying in our school students studying for primary education to work in early years um to work in other children and youth services it's the final module that they study and quite often on degree pathways the final module does have a strong research emphasis because our final years hope to equip and launch students into postgraduate study if that's what they're interested in and actually develop those skills of research that they'd need to do that so on our module, the final assessment that a student has to do is a plan for a small scale piece of research that they could could carry out in their replay in their workplace. So they don't do it. They just plan it. And what I was hearing was students saying, oh, but I really want to put this into practice. And a couple of years ago, a student actually rang me after she'd graduated and said, Kate, will you supervise the piece of research that I want to do following having done that course? And I thought, well, yeah, I can help. But maybe there's a broader issue here about how do we encourage our students to go ahead and have a go to take what they've done and put it into practice in their workplace as practitioners. So this is a practitioner research award that we've set up in partnership with the Children's Research Centre, which is one of our research centres in the Open University. And in its first year, we were able to offer three awards and um, we prioritise students who um, who have what we call protected characteristics. So um, students from um, black and Asian and minority ethnic communities, um, care experience students, students with disabilities and mental health difficulties, and, and also students who worked with children and young people who come within those kind of specific categories as well. And we were able to offer three awards. And in this last year, then we've had three students who've gone ahead and put their research into practice. We've had so much interest this year that I went back to the school and begged for a bit more money to offer four awards because we've also had students who've wanted to do research particularly connected to the impact of COVID on children and young people. Mm -hmm. So we've introduced a fourth award that specifically is focusing on, on COVID and the impact of COVID. And what we offer students is one-to-one -one mentoring throughout the, the year that they'll be carrying out their research. And that's mentoring through through with an associate lecturer or a member of the academic uh, central academic team. We offer 
the use of the resources from the Children's Research Centre. We offer a series of workshops where in very small group, we work together with some of our academics looking at more advanced research issues, particularly ethics, for instance. And we also offer a bursary of up to £500 to pay for expenses for doing that project. So we found that our students have used that money to buy cameras, buy equipment, and maybe buy a bit of cover for their time while they've been doing their research. And the three projects we've got at the moment are all taking place in schools. Excellent. It sounds, the, the opportunity to not only plan, but to carry out that research sounds fantastic. Yeah. Uh, if I could bring us back to the question we had um, earlier from Deborah, uh, are there any um, books that you can recommend to help people start with their research? So those of us who aren't um, research experts, what, what's a good starting point? <laughs> well, that's a very good question because we're, we tend to be quite subject specific. So I might bat this question back to Alison in a minute. If you're interested in research with children and young people, I really suggest that rather than starting with a book, you have a look at the Children's Research Centre website. And there's some brilliant resources on there about how to carry out research, but particularly how to encourage children and young people themselves to become researchers. So they're skills that we share right across the board with, with children and young people and ourselves as researchers. So I would say start with the Children's Research website, uh, Research Centre website. But Alison, perhaps you'd like to come in there because you've probably got some more generic advice there. Hi. Um, so, well, I, I would say, like you were saying, that it depends on the sorts of research you want to carry out. And so I think the library, you know, people pointed to the library is the best place to go because um, if you're interested in, um, in, you were talking about sort of, uh, sort of practitioner research if you're interested in action research there's some really key authors that have written in a really accessible way in a very practical way but it might not be that that's the sort of design you want to carry out there are generic books about um research the research process in social science but the library staff will be the best to guide you because there are tomes you know that we recommend and we guide those and, and and use those to support particular programs but actually you don't want to read a tome of of everything you could do um and refer to different tools you could use you don't want to be overwhelmed when you start with all the possibilities um and so i i would say um talking about the topic the the, the context that you want to um research in the type of focus that the questions you have um that um the library staff if they can't answer it themselves they know their subject areas and the disciplines uh, very well. They'll come back to, to, to colleagues in those areas and, and, and ask for some recommendations. The, the library is a fantastic resource. Absolutely. And um, if students aren't aware, the, the, the library actually runs training sessions on a whole range of topics. And I believe research techniques is one of the sessions they run. So if you've never been there, go to the OU Library website have a look, see what training sessions are coming up, and you might find you can actually have a session on research itself, which is uh, a really nice opportunity to get started. And of course, who knows, you may be taking part in the project and carrying out the research yourself in the future, which would be fantastic. Uh, we're going to jump back to HJ now and see what students are saying. Uh, we're going to be coming to have a broader discussion on student um, engagement with research in a moment. So this is a good point for you to ask any questions that you want us to put to the panel. Um, so HJ, it looks like we've got 85% of our audience are currently studying. So of our 85% of the audience studying, what questions have they got? What do they want to know so far? So one thing, and I think it's a fantastic uh, question from Deborah, is we talked about the wellbeing handbook earlier. We're interested to know if the uh, Wellbeing Handbook will have anything for neurodivergent students, as uh, we're very diverse in the OU. So it'd be good to know if that's covered as well. Okay. We will definitely cover that in the next topic. So uh, <laughs> panel members, get ready for that question. That's going to be popping up in a moment. So any other questions leaping out, HJ? Anything else that perhaps uh, they'd like to have clarified or something we haven't covered yet? 
So I think we're all happy in the chat and we've been putting the links in for the library sessions as well. I've attended one myself and they're <laughs> definitely very useful. I actually sometimes um, have attended the same one a couple of times because you always get so many great hints and tips from it. So if you've got any tips or things that you've found, I know there's um, a great open learning course on postgraduate yeah. research that someone posted in the chat. Let us know about it. It's always good to share and we'd love to um, hear about your hints and tips as well. But we got uh, some great questions. As Rob said, we do have them in mind and we will get yeah. to them for you. Excellent. And yeah, I can't endorse that enough. You guys have got a lot of really useful uh, resources and hints that you can share. So share them in the chat and we'll make sure that everybody gets to see them. So for the last um, uh, 20 minutes or so, we're going to have a, a more a broader group discussion about um, how students in general have got involved, what they've said about research and scholarship. And I'm going to give you each a chance to come back on this. But also, if you can keep in mind that question about um, the handbook, so probably Steph, when it comes to you, uh, specifically, if there's anything in the handbook about uh, neurodivergent students. So actually, let's start with Steph. Just, just to throw you out of order, start with Steph. Is there anything in there, Steph, that uh, specifically deals um, with that question? Um, short answer is yes. Um, the longer <laughs> answer is uh, one of yes. the key things. <laughs> one of the one of the key things. I should have just stopped there, shouldn't I? One of the key <laughs> things we wanted to do um, in this handbook is make sure that we were talking to diverse students, because as we mm -hmm. know at the OU. And there's no one size fits all for our students. When someone asks me, what is a typical OU student? I always say there is no answer to that question. So it was really important to us that that, that kind of thing was absolutely acknowledged. Um, the students who, or I should say, uh, the four students that were involved in the development of the handbook um, have various uh, diversity, um, you know, various elements of diversity. And within that, is neurodiversity. So actually sections of the handbook have been written by students um, with neurodiversity. So yeah, absolutely. And that, that as I said, was really, really important to us that, that everyone, you know, students' needs were, were sort of catered for within the handbook. So yeah, a, a, small, a longer winded answer, but short answer, <laughs> yes, absolutely. No, thank you. No, that was great. That's what we wanted to do. So Alison, Tell us about um, your engagement with students and research and uh, and how you've managed to get students more involved. And I'm looking for some nice, uh, nice anecdotes of things that you've seen from some of the students. Great. Um, I just want to <laughs> follow on from the previous um, the previous discussion just before I move into that, because um, you mentioned yep. open learn um, and there is a becoming an ethical researcher um, open learn course, which anybody can take that was designed for students all across the university and covers a whole range of topics, um, as Kate was referring to um, ethical issues. Are, uh, and and um, you know we were talking about earlier even in, in Anne's presentation even the topic itself you know raises ethical issues as what should be researched so if anybody's interested in in having a look at that course I, I wanted to give that a little bit of a plug um, but uh, in terms of consulting with students one thing I'd highly recommend is um, if you ever get chance to engage with the student consultation panel which is in itself a sort of form of research in that it's got a very structured set of questions and in particular um, I was involved with the consultation about the draft of the teaching and learning plan so you can imagine that's um, going to inform our thinking about the sort of scholarship um, that we should be carrying out to um, respond to, to students' views on, on that uh, teaching and learning plan, but also to feed into to our teaching and learning. Um, and I was responsible for the thread um, that was looking at the, the what will become a, a principle three, which was looking at... Um, the principle that OU teaching and learning should be um, an academically rigorous research-based, um, research-informed pro process. So referring back to the, the points that Kate was mentioning earlier about both the, the curriculum and the, the content of the, of the um, 
the courses that you study. And things that came out of that were that the students um, really wanted to be more aware of what research was going on and what scholarship was going on, and perhaps weren't aware of the scholarship centres that we have. So um, we should have mentioned earlier that not only do Kate and Jackie and I work very closely with one another in in the the school, but we work very closely with Claire Saunders, um, who runs the... um, our Wells Scholarship Centre, which is called Praxis. There are other scholarship centres in in the other faculties. You might have heard in passing reference to Esteem or Fastest or Skylab. As you say, we love our acronyms. <laughs> they all mean something in their longest term. But they're all they're all yeah. centres for scholarship, and they're a, they're allowing us to ba- ba- target the sort of scholarship that carries uh, is carried out on important topics. Um, and, but also to bring together the learning from that within faculties and across faculties. So um, students were asking to be more um, made more aware of that. Um, in particular, um, one strand that um, Kate mentioned earlier is that nearly a really strong push is for students to be involved with as many of us our, our scholarship projects as, as possible. Um, and, and Kate will be able to give some examples of those. Um, but it's not just, it, it can be from student generated ideas as well. And Anne didn't have time to talk about it, but Anne in our master's program actually came up with an idea for a research project. As she moved through the program and she was working as a student coach that w- where she was supporting some of the other students and other modules she started looking at the forums and she started to get very cross that um, we were putting content up that was challenging uh, our thinking about um, learners' identity and agency um, and how it was challenged by the assessment regimes in schools and, and, and colleges. And she said, this is happening every year and we're all learning about it and we're all getting to become very activist about it. But we can't act alone just because we've studied our course and we've gone back as an individual can we do something about our collective learning about this? So we've been carrying out a project um, looking across the students' posts, but also interviewing students. So students have been interviewing other students. Um, and um, yeah, we've, we've delivered some seminars about it and Anne's helping us think about where we should feed those findings back. So she's very in- involved with the unions. So um, we're, we're going to speak to those. We're going to go into practitioner focused journals. So so having an idea and coming to people with the idea um, is, mm-hmm. is is definitely a possibility if we can make it happen um, as the example that um, Kate's scaled mm-hmm. up as well for, for her module. It's great I can talk to about the conference, but I think you're going to you're going to prompt me about we, that later. I'm going to ask you about the conference as the last thing we chat about. Yeah. So uh, don't worry, we'll, we'll get the conference in. Uh, I just want to pick up on open learn something you mentioned there. The uh, people on the hot desk they are right on the ball, and the general link to open learn is there, and the specific link to the um, the short course that you mentioned. Uh, I want to come to Kitty now. So. Kitty, we're hearing a lot about students getting involved in scholarship and research. I know when I was a student, when I first started, um, I was a bit nervous when I was talking to academics and a little bit worried that, you know, what can I bring to the table? So how did you find it working with all these uh, super clever people and taking part in research? How did you manage to to get over those nerves? Because it would have probably paralysed me. Yes, you're right. I was very <laughs> nervous at the beginning, but then I started thinking about all the opportunities that I would have to learn and experience um, research in different perspectives and the ways that I could interpret it to ground my base knowledge and further support my studies as a student. So it was quite exciting in that respect. Um, I did just want to quickly point out um, there is a research website that might be useful for everyone. It's called BERA, and that stands for the British Ethics and Research Association. And that was one of the websites that I used to learn about researching, because obviously at the time I had no idea about research, what it was, what it involved, or anything like that. So I went to this website and I got a lot of good information from there about research, how it works, what you can do to support yourself, because obviously when you're researching, a lot of the time you are doing it yourself. So you need to learn how to 
put that in that implication into process and by working with others in the university um you start by having a conversation you can find out more information and it's really helped to develop my research and study ethics that's fantastic. And hopefully we've inspired a few of you out there to come and get involved in research in some of the scholarship projects. So let us know if, uh, if we've inspired you and you're going to start looking at some. Um, I'm just having a quick look at my list. Steph, I think um, you had a, a little more to add because you answered our question last time. So is there anything you wanted yeah. to add on any feedback you've had from students as you've been working on the, the research and scholarship? Um, yeah, I think it, it echoes a lot of what Kitty said, that I think sometimes students do feel a little bit apprehensive um, getting involved in things that are maybe stepping away from their usual modules and so on. Um, but the feedback we've had from our ambassadors, and I, you know, Kitty's alluded to this already, the feedback we've had from our ambassadors of being involved in various projects is actually, you know, how how generous they've been with their time and they and they absolutely have been generous with their time and and but how much they've got out of it and and I think that's been really important as I mentioned earlier this kind of holistic approach to well-being but it's actually also a, a holistic approach to I think being being an OU student as well so um, getting involved uh, in in different projects that that stretch beyond you know their module materials their assessments and so on I think just gives students you know really invaluable experience broadens their own knowledge base and and certainly the feedback I've had is that it develops skills that they can not only use in their studies but they also take into other elements of, of life whether that's kind of the workplace and so on so yeah I think it's something that um, you know be aware of it's something that you are interested in yeah take that leap take that jump and you'll find that you have some very supportive staff to help you along the way with that fantastic and it's it's another opportunity to develop those real transferable skills that we don't just use in our studies but we can actually take and use in all different areas of life uh, i want to make sure i give alison enough time to talk about the conference so alison I know we've got the link to the conference on the Student Hub Live website, but tell them, tell them, those who've joined us, why they need to go and do something now. <laughs> oh, I can't hear Alison at the moment. Sorry. Um, oh, there sorry. we go. <laughs> I can hear you now. <laughs> Um, so yes, we we took from from the um, consultation that I was talking about, and I just I should say that Steph Dula is now on that student consultation panel. So um, if you if you want a, a friendly face, then um, go to one of those student consultations. We do listen, and one of the things that people were saying that they wanted to hear about was stories from other students um, about from different stages of study. They wanted to hear about uh, research in in our school, and they wanted uh, to, to to get involved with thinking about it. So we're running a conference. It's actually starting um, tomorrow with the PGC Wales course, where all of the students carry out a piece of research as they train to, to be teachers in Wales. Um, and then on the Saturday, we've got um, a conference that you can sign up for. The deadline's at five o'clock today. That's, uh, that's why it's really timely for us to have a chance to speak to you about it. And we've got student stories and show and tell, then we've got a showcase of, of research, and then we've got a workshop in the afternoon where we're using personal development planning. Um, it's all uh, led and organized by students for students. Um, and, and we're really excited about that. This is our first time that we've, uh, we've tried that. We hope it'll be an annual event. Absolutely, and so anybody can come along and register for the conference. It's just use the link, is it, yes. is it that simple? Yes, um, we do have a limit because it's the first time we're hosting it. So it's the first um, 250. That's as many as teams will host. All oh, right. <laughs> but we're not quite Excellent. there yet. OK, so if you want to take part, there's, there's still a small amount of room. So be quick. OK, so I, I'm conscious, Kate, that we haven't come to you yet. Is there anything you wanted to add from um, uh, from your point of view, uh, just in a couple of minutes, but anything you wanted to add as uh, final comments? 
Yeah, I think, first of all, what we've heard lots of examples today that research and scholarship involves all of us and there are opportunities for all of us and, and students should really um, believe in themselves that they can be part of our, our research and scholarship activity. And that's researching topics that they're really interested in, but also helping us research um, teaching and learning in our university and research the student experience. So our student voice work is very much about hearing and exploring and researching student experience and how we can make that experience even better in the university. So I think that that's that's one point. And just a couple of examples from my own school in uh, Praxis Research Centre is one of our priorities this year is building our partnerships in scholarship with students. And we have two wonderful projects going on at the moment where staff and students are working together to form a scholarship team, exploring the experience of black students and South Asian students, actually specifically in these two projects. And um, in order to develop um, more inclusive um, teaching resources, learning experiences, and look at closing some of those vital awarding gaps that we're being challenged to address at the moment. So get involved is what I want to say. Get involved, <laughs> you'd be very, very welcome. <laughs> Absolutely, we've definitely sent some challenges out today. So I think it might be worth having another quick look at the word cloud to see whether this discussion has prompted any further points and then we're going to go to HJ who's going to talk us through uh, any more points that have come up in the chat so um, what is it on oh, future journals are innovative and interesting I, I've noticed that interesting has grown quite significantly on the on the word cloud which means more of you are putting it in um, advancing societies excellent so making a difference research and scholarship making a difference so, HJ, for the final time this session, what have we heard from the chat box? Well, I'm really pleased. We talked about it earlier, but Paula said she got involved uh, with the FBL student audit for the OU, where um, they reviewed B302 specifically regarding inclusivity, diversity and representation and reviewed the EMA guidance and collaborative activity as well. So it's great to hear that people are getting involved. Mm -hmm. And it's always great opportunities to build your skills, whether you get involved with these audits, the Students Association, just your local community on your module through the forums and the pages as well. And uh, the... Um, Gil, who's been helping me in the chat, and uh, Joanne have been sharing lots of great resources for research as well. But if you're a bit more like me and sometimes think, these are all great, how do people know about all this? Don't worry at all. All the main resources we've talked about today, we've got on the um, page for this session that you can look back on, including those great open link courses. And while you progress through your study, it may be a case that you don't need these things now, but later on you'll think, ah, oh, I remember that session where I heard about this really great uh, open link course some research. I think I'll do that maybe over the summer to prepare for my level three module. So mm -hmm. there's lots of time. And as you go along, I know some people are nervous, you'll develop your skills and you'll come to be a very good researcher, probably better than you realize. We are our own harsh critics, as we said in the chat. So thank you for everyone who joined us and sharing all your uh, thoughts, comments and questions and those fantastic links. I know we've got some uh, workshop sessions coming up as well on critical writing, which will help us when it comes to thinking about research and evaluating it as well. So I'm sure we'll see everyone in the chat there soon. Absolutely. And, and thanks for emphasising that, uh, uh, HJ. Yes, if you want to come to some of the workshops, come and uh, join myself and Isabella and have a, a bit of a giggle uh, whilst uh, we'll talk about some really serious topics at the same time. So I'd just like to say thank you to Alison, Steph and Kate for joining me today and to Kitty. It's lovely to have students join us uh, in the session. So you did a fantastic job, Kitty, and hopefully you've inspired some other students to come and join us in the sessions. So it's been um, great to talk to you all. Remember that you can watch this video back on YouTube uh, later and all of the resources, including the Open Learn resources, can be gained from the website. So thank you everyone for being involved and I look forward to seeing you next time. So Robin is study shack saying bye for now.